Welcome to another live session for the MOOC. Um, fielding all your questions either live with us on the session or sent by email, and the floor is open. All right, the first question from Joan is, as space-time is curved, will the universe wrap around itself eventually? Uh, it's possible in principle. So space-time has the potential to be curved because it's built into general relativity, which states that the curvature of space-time is related to the mass energy density within that space-time. So mass energy density, when it's very concentrated, like in a black hole or a compact stellar remnant, can curve space-time around it or approximately to it. And the same can apply to the entire universe. However, it turns out it's a question of theory that it's possible, but it's a question of observation whether it in fact happens. And now we have very accurate observations of the curvature of space-time on a cosmic scale from the microwave background. Essentially, the model tells you what the size of the speckles in the microwave background should be, and they turn out to be measured at about a degree, and that's looking back across space and time to 400,000 years after the Big Bang. The radiation then travels through the universe, and those speckles would either be magnified or demagnified if space-time were positively or negatively curved, respectively. In fact, the measurement shows they're not magnified or demagnified. They have exactly the angular size predicted by the model within less than 2%. I think it's about 1%. So the empirical result is that space-time is flat cosmically on a cosmic scale, tens of billions of light years, within 1%. So while general relativity allows the universe to be curved on a global scale, it appears not to be. Now, does that rule out the fact that it will curve over on itself at some point? Not necessarily. It just means that the patch of space-time that we can see with our telescopes, which is 46 billion light years in every direction, it's a pretty impressive amount of space, uh, is completely flat. If, however, the observable universe is bigger than the universe we can see, sorry, the physical universe is bigger than the observable universe. So there's no question that we've seen all of space time. And so we can't rule out the possibility of curvature on even larger scales. But essentially, they'd have to be scales much larger than of order 100 billion light years. Okay, the next question is from Sonia. Is the Drake equation still used as a way of estimating the probability of life in our galaxy? Or has it been supplanted by another theory? And what's your view on the effectiveness of this or any other such equations? Yeah, good question. We haven't had this this question before. Um, the Drake equation is still used. It's a venerable tool of astrobiology. Uh, Frank Drake was at a conference. It's The story of it is, of course, also quite interesting. Frank Drake was at a conference in 1960, maybe wrong by a year on that exact year. Um, in 1959, Frank Drake had done Project Ozma, named after the Frank Baum Wizard of Oz books, um, where he observed two nearby bright stars for artificial radio signals using the Green Bank telescopes. The, uh, Frank Drake was a young postdoc at that time, working at NRAO. Uh, and the year after that, or maybe two years after that, NRAO organized a small meeting to talk about the possibility of life in the universe, triggered by Project Ozma and people starting to think about this. People who attended that meeting include some very famous people, Philip Morrison, very famous physicist, astrophysicist, and of course Carl Sagan. Frank Drake led the meeting, even as a young postdoc, and searching for a way of organizing what was basically a pretty informal meeting, he went to the blackboard and pretty much in real time wrote what we now know as the Drake Equation. And it's stuck ever since. So that's basically 55 years ago. Uh, he himself has called it a container for ignorance rather than a, you know, exquisite formalism for astrobiology. It's a series of numerical factors that multiplied together give the number of intelligent communicable civilizations in the galaxy at any given time. Uh, and it's still useful for that purpose, mostly because we're ignorant of so many pieces of the Drake equation. Perhaps if the field had progressed even further or even faster, we'd have a new formalism or we'd have a new tool for understanding astrobiology. But as things stand, it's still fairly useful because we're so ignorant of all the Drake equation factors that involve biology, sociology, technology, and so on. 
But if you look at the Drake equation, the first three terms of the Drake equation have essentially been determined by measurement. That is the birth rate of new sun-like stars in the Milky Way, the average number of planets per star, and the number of those planets that are Earth-like. That last number will come out of Kepler with some precision, but we already have an, an idea of what it is. So those first three factors are actually known. The ones that follow are the likelihood that, or the probability that life actually forms given a habitable planet, the probability that that life becomes intelligent, the probability that intelligent life eventually develops technology, and the number of years that that civilization exists in a communicable state. And those four factors are completely unknown, indeterminate. So the Drake equation is definitely still useful. It's very easy to talk about, it's easy to write, it's easy to think about, and it sort of unpacks the complex issues of astrobiology in a very simple way. All right, the next question is from someone who is on live with us. It is a well-known fact that heavier objects have greater gravity than less heavy ones. What is the actual phenomenon that causes an object to have gravity? Where does the gravity of an object come from? It's a good question, and uh, someone very great, such as Isaac Newton, was asked about the nature of gravity, this law that he described with a, a law, universal law that still applies in most of astronomy. And he said, I frame no hypothesis. In other words, he said he didn't know where gravity came from. So if Isaac Newton didn't know where gravity came from, then I will be excused claiming the same ignorance. Um, but of course, it's a great question. What is the source or the origin of gravity? What we do know about gravity is that in our understanding of it, gravity applies to anything that has mass, anything that has substance. And so, yes, subatomic particles, tiny subatomic particles have gravity, protons, neutrons, quarks, electrons, as do black holes, as do galaxies, as does the universe as a whole. So gravity applies to everything that has substance, everything that's made of matter, even the tiny components of big objects. So that much we do know. The nature of gravity is still unclear. In theoretical physics, gravity is conceptualized the same way the other fundamental forces are, in terms of an interaction particle called the graviton, just as the photon is the interaction particle for the electromagnetic force. However, the graviton has never been observed, and in this theory, in the fundamental physics theory aligned with particle physics, the graviton is an integer spin particle. It has the quantum spin of two, as it turns out. It's a boson. Um, obeying Bose-Einstein statistics, uh, and it travels at the speed of light. So gravity is carried at the speed of light. That fact also has not been verified. So physicists have been trying for quite a while to measure the speed at which gravity propagates. And you can understand that's a hard thing to do because you'd have to suddenly conjure up some mass or material out of nothing and then watch how fast the signal of the gravity of that mass propagates through space. It's an extremely difficult experiment, and no one has yet succeeded, even indirectly, in doing this. So the question of what causes gravity and does it is it transmitted by a particle the way the other fundamental forces are is still an open question. And it's a very interesting that at such a base level of physics, we can still be unsure of such a fundamental theory. Okay, the next question is from Julian, who is on with us live. What do you what did you think of the Pluto encounter? Pluto encounter was amazing, and people had sort of forgotten about Pluto. It was booted out of the pantheon of planets unceremoniously by astronomers a decade or so ago, causing a fair amount of uproar. Astronomers sort of moved on. They recognized that the Kuiper Belt, um, this large region of space extending from about 40 to 80 astronomical units from the sun, almost certainly it is known to contain at least one object larger than Pluto and very probably contains four to six objects larger than Pluto when it's fully surfing. So astronomers sort of got over Pluto and its special status as a planet and also thought that it would be a rather dull object because uh, planets the size of Pluto or moons that size should not have atmospheres, should not have enough mass to have radioactive heating in the interior that would cause geological activity or changes to their surfaces. And so they, you expect them to be barren, lifeless, crater-pocked objects in space. And that's not what New Horizons saw. So the New Horizons encounter was, was exceptional because for NASA, just thinking about it in prospect, it was just ticking the box. You know, we visited every large outer solar system object. 
even NASA engineers, even the scientists behind the mission, they may have harbored hopes, but they didn't really think that it would find such enigmas and such mysteries. So when New Horizons whizzed by Pluto and saw this surface that was very interestingly textured, that clearly was young, as young as 100 million years in some places and by some estimates, uh, and very complex textures, different interesting textures in different parts of Pluto's surface, um, also discovering a few tiny little moonlets of Jupiter along the way. That was incredibly exciting, and it's raised mysteries and questions that are still not answered because we still don't know what it is for a isolated, very small subplanetary object, dwarf planet. Why does it have so much interior activity to generate changes to its surface? Still not understood. Okay, the next question is all from Tom, who is also on with us live. If there was one single bang in our universe, how come there are such huge voids between galaxies? Right, so good question about um, cosmology, about the assumption of cosmology. It, the a premise of how people started to work the calculations of cosmology was called the cosmological principle that dates back from the 1930s from Friedman and Hubble and the early development of the subject. The cosmological principle states that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. Isotropic means it looks the same in any direction, and we verified that with the Hubble deep fields, north and south, and various other deep surveys, so we don't see different types of galaxies or numbers of galaxies and variations with redshift looking in different directions. The homogeneity is harder to test, because that says that the universe would appear roughly the same wherever you were in the universe. And that's hard to test because we can see what our local universe looks like, what the galaxies within a few hundred million light years are like. But if we look at the universe a few billion light years away, another big chunk of it, we're of course looking at a younger version of our universe because we're looking back in time. So we're comparing apples and oranges. We're comparing the large scale structure of the universe then, out there, with the universe, uh, the large scale structure of the universe now, or in the very recent past near us. Um, so to get to the question, how can the universe have these very large entities called voids? And the biggest voids that have been found are about two or 300 million light years across. They're very large. The answer is that gravity is a nonlinear force in terms of how it builds structure. So although the universe may have started smooth and, and completely homogeneous, which is to say smooth, the density not varying, by more than a tiny amount from one space to another. In fact, at the epoch of the microwave background, the radiation is uniform to one part in 100,000, and the matter densities follow the radiation at that point, and so their variations are extremely small. So the universe was definitely super smooth very early on. But as the structure grows in the universe, as gravity causes things to collapse into objects like galaxies and then clusters and superclusters, it operates in a nonlinear way. As mass is added to a region of space, the strength of that gravity increases, which pulls in more matter, and it's a sort of an accelerating process, which in the form of a galaxy leads to gravitational collapse and an object forming. On the larger scales, it still leads to structures forming in a slightly nonlinear way, and that allows gravity to evacuate large regions, pretty much of all matter, not dark matter, but all matter, while leaving uh, most of the concentrations of matter in sheets and filaments in this very interesting texture, sort of egg, egg drop soup-like texture of large-scale structure. So this um, structure in the presence of very large voids is understood in terms of a simple gravity theory, one force of nature. The role of dark matter is important, however, in the formation of the structure. and this structure can really only be understood if the dark matter is cold, which is to say it's a subatomic particle that interacts weakly or not at all with radiation uh, and was moving relativistically at the time of the microwave background radiation. So it is indeed part of the standard development of gravity as a nonlinear force building structures that you could have very large voids. However, the large-scale homogeneity of the universe still applies. That if that is, if you pick a large enough scale compared to the observable universe scale, you should find every patch of the universe to be roughly the same, which means the theory predicts there should be no voids or clusters, or say superclusters, no structures or sort of anti-structures, voids, 
that are significantly larger than about 300 million light years. And so far, that is indeed the largest size of any void that's been found. In other words, if you look on yet larger scales and take chunks of the universe that are half a, um, half a billion light years across or a billion light years across, they're pretty much the same mean density from one to another. All right, uh, the next question is from Janet via email. Why can't visual spectrum telescopes sum in area like radio telescopes can? Can they sum? I missed a word there. Sorry, why can't um, optical telescopes sum in area like oh. radio telescopes do? Um, so the technique of interferometry, which allows disparate or separated telescopes to combine their information, <coughs> it of course, allows them to sum their information in terms of radiation gathering power, but more usefully it applies to resolution, angular resolution, because it simulates a telescope that has the angular resolution of a size equal to the spacing between the telescopes. So as, as the question uh, implies, this technique is mature in radio astronomy and it's been used since the 1950s. The very large array, array is the most famous telescope in the United States that operates this way. But there are some telescopes like this in the UK, Europe, Australia, and so on. For optical radiation, the same trick is possible. Interferometry is possible and it's been known that it could be done in principle. But because optical waves of light are billions of times smaller than radio waves, the methods for combining them coherently, which is to say combining radiation from separate telescopes where you preserve the information to within a wavelength of the radiation is much harder. So the wavelength of the radiation used by the very large array is a few centimeters. So a waveguide technology, which has been around for half a century, can easily combine radio waves over large distances and keep the coherence or track the wavelengths within a few centimeters. But with, radio, with optical light, you're having to do it within nanometers. You're having to do it within uh, you know, tiny, tiny fractions of a meter. And doing that coherently requires uh, evacuated tubes. It requires a pure vacuum because the travel time of light through air will vary with, with obviously the density and the temperature of the air, which is a problem. And it also requires essentially a Michelson interferometer. It requires you know, very careful tracking of the wavelength of light. And that has been possible in the lab for a few decades, but on a telescope, it's harder to arrange. However, it is possible. The Palomar, Palomar has had a testbed interferometer operating on a one meter telescope in Mount Palomar for over a decade, 15 years, and then gathering routine data for 10 years. And interferometry has now been tested with the CAG telescopes on Mauna Kea, which are 10 meter telescopes separated by 50 meters, where the tunnel, the evacuated tube is under the cinder cone. And we're doing this trick with our large binocular telescope, where there are two 11-meter uh, telescopes on a common, or 8.4-meter telescope mirrors on a common mount, and we combine the radiation from them. So it hasn't been possible till recently, but optical interferometry is now being done on a handful of the world's largest telescopes. It still remains a very challenging thing to do. All right, the next question comes from Sonia. The latest issue of Astronomy Magazine contains an article concerning multiverse theories. One physicist quoted in the article believes that humans can find a better, deeper understanding of the laws of physics if we stop overwhelming ourselves with non-answers to problems such as multiverse theories. Do you think that these theories, such as the multiverse, is hindering the current advancement of physics and astronomy, and should we abandon these in favor of a more robust Testable set of theories? I mean, it's a good question, and I, I haven't read that issue, but I understand the perspective that's being represented. But this is a quite a divisive issue amongst cosmologists and physicists, the, the multiverse idea. Um, and it's really a question of epistemology. It's a question, so, so there are two sides to this. On the one hand, we don't know everything about the universe, and that, that should liberate, especially theorists to experiment with ideas, to play with ideas, to try things out, to see, you know, push the limits of their theories, since we don't have a fundamental and ultimate theory of nature. So that's one perspective. The other perspective is a little more hard-nosed based on the scientific method, which says you're sort of wasting your time. A wide range of theories, which are not testable. 
because if you do that, that's metaphysics, it's philosophy, it's, uh, it's not science. Uh, and that's a legitimate perspective too. What's happened in this area with the multiverse, however, is these positions have sort of hardened. And so there are some theorists who dismiss the other side, the skeptics, and say, no, this is incredibly exciting stuff because there are indications we should be pursuing the multiverse idea. And to not do so is to miss incredible opportunities. Uh, given that we don't understand the universe, this is a way to make progress. The hardening position on the other side is sort of just uh, denigrates the multiverse idea and says it's not testable, it's not uh, experimentally verifiable, it's not science, you shouldn't be doing it. So let's get back to the middle ground here. What What is the perspective on the multiverse idea and where does it come from? In simple terms, without taking too long over this one question, the multiverse idea is a natural consequence of inflationary cosmology. The inflationary cosmology, uh, the idea, the embellishment of the standard Big Bang from 1980, Alan Guth, is that the universe underwent an inflationary epoch, a tiny fraction of a second after the Big Bang, that was driven by the grand unified theory, by the separation of three of the four forces of nature as the universe cooled down from an incredibly high temperature. That is not really in doubt. That that era and that epoch and that uh, event should have happened in terms of theory. We do have no direct evidence for inflation, just some interesting indirect evidence. The indirect evidence, though, from the microwave background is good enough that it has got people looking through the implications of inflation. And one of the implications is that the things that we see as galaxies or speckles in the microwave background are quantum fluctuations inflated to the size of galaxies. And that's liberated, sort of following a chain of logic here, that's liberated theorists to imagine that our patch of space-time, which is to say our observable universe, could have been a quantum event, quantum genesis. And if that was one quantum event, why weren't there perhaps other quantum events with different physical properties and different uh, eventual outcomes? Maybe universes that inflated, some that didn't inflate, universes with different laws of physics, distinct space-times, so quite separate from each other. And that's the multiverse idea. So the multiverse does stem naturally, if not completely inevitably, from inflationary cosmology. And I think that's legitimate enough for people to work on the idea. However, they should be held to the standard of developing a testable theory. And some of them would say they're getting there. There are some theorists working on multiverse ideas, quantum genesis, other possible space times who are looking at the possibility of detecting the existence of those other space-times by interactions either through gravitational waves very early in the history of those space-times or possibly by interactions through superior and extra dimensions in string theory. That latter option, of course, is even more speculative. So that other people criticize string theory on different grounds. So I'm pretty much in the middle on this one. I think uh, the people who were being hard-nosed and saying it's not science are actually overstating the case. It is science. It's a legitimate extension of the frontier of cosmology. The people who are overly enthusiastic about multiverse and maybe oversell it uh, should take a cautionary note that if they are not able to produce uh, a prediction that could test the multiverse idea at some point, give them some time to develop the theory and then hold them accountable for making a prediction that observers like myself or people like me can test. And if they can, of course, it isn't science, it's metaphysics and can be criticized as such. All right, the next question is from somebody who is live. Um, Aaron asks, how can they apply fresh aluminum mirror look uh, to start over, how can they apply fresh aluminum mirror layer coating in situ on very large telescope mirrors and how can they maintain it to a certain thickness accuracy and how they keep it clean? Right, so it's a good question. It's, it's very basic to telescopes. Um, so telescopes, as you know, are out in the elements. I mean, we, you're not allowed to observe when it's actually raining <laughs> and most people don't observe when there are clouds. But, you know, things can happen uh, when the dew point changes extremely quickly. Sometimes astronomers get caught out and they actually can form condensation on the mirror. Also, you're out there in the elements. Most telescopes close down when the wind goes beyond a certain amount. And that, of course, is primarily because the telescope doesn't point very well or mechanical resonances cause it to oscillate and means it can't point. It's sort of wobbling 
very slightly by an amount that messes up your data. But going along with the wind, of course, is blown dust. And so telescopes are in a regime where moisture and dust is just part of the equation. And that inevitably leads to the reflective surface, that front surface that's coated, as the question implies, by a very thin layer of aluminum, perhaps 20 to 40 nanometers of aluminum. It will degrade over time. And so virtually every major telescope has to have its mirrors resurfaced every few years. And how often sort of depends on how carefully the telescope is tended. Recognize there's a tension there because astronomers always want to use the telescope in marginal conditions as long as they can take data. The telescope operators and the directors of the observatory are trying to protect the telescopes, extend the life of the mirrors, so they will want to close down. So there had to be rules. It used to be that telescope mirrors were re-illuminized in an illuminizing tank, a vacuum tank, somewhere in the dome. And if so, if you go to the Palomar Observatory, the world's biggest telescope, except for the Russian six meter, which does it a similar way too, uh, for 40 years or 50 years, the 200 inch, it sits there and there's a track on the floor, like a railroad track, and the mirror cell would drop uh, onto a, a railroad car, which would carry the mirror cell across the dome, distance of 20 meters, and then raise it into a vacuum luminizing tank. And they did that every few years. So that's the way it used to be done. The modern idea is, is different in part because the telescopes are more compact and more uh, tightly fitted within their domes. The Palomar dome is very big compared to the telescope that it contains. Modern telescopes, are, are all quite tightly bounded by their domes. And so there's not really room to do the illuminizing tank somewhere else. And the second thing is, of course, taking a mirror out of its cell is extremely hazardous. Every time you do it, you risk breaking it, moving it across the telescope floor into a tank and then back again. So, so engineers simply do not want to remove the mirror. And so they quickly sort of developed in the 1980s and 90s a method whereby within the mirror cell itself on the telescope you had a vacuum situation you had a potential for a sealed unit with the addition of a top a top to it of course it's mostly pointing up at the sky um, and then you could seal that evacuate it to about 10 to the minus 6 tor uh, and then put a sputtering chamber on top and a sputtering chamber is just a you know, electrically induced mechanism whereby aluminum molecules, atoms of molecules, are evaporated uh, from a single element in a uniform way across onto the mirror. And that's the way it's done now. So basically, every same time frame, every couple of years, major telescopes go out of service for a while. They have the top uh, element clamped on top of the mirror cell, evacuated they sputter a new surface onto the mirror and then they remove that top part of the clamshell if you like and then keep observing. It's still a little hazardous. It makes engineers nervous every time that's done with a large telescope because you're moving a very large multi-ton piece of metal over the top of your mirror and the illuminizing process itself can sometimes go wrong. Uh, non-uniform surface, something, you know, temperature too high, too much material, etc. cetera. There, there are problems with that, but, but it's pretty much a craft that's been perfected at most major observatories. They all share information too, so the engineers who do this, a specialized breed, they share information and make sure they all get it right. So, illuminizing telescopes is, is standard procedure. I'll give one, I'll finish with a tiny story from my uh, my uh, youth, if you like. When I was a graduate student in Edinburgh, I went out to Hawaii to use the UK infrared telescope, which is an optical infrared telescope illuminized in the standard way, 3.8 meter. And that telescope had some radio astronomers, millimeter astronomers, that were using it. Now, radio astronomy is done with, uh, often with dishes that are made of aluminum mesh, not a thin coating of aluminum on glass, but aluminum, an aluminum surface, a mesh, which, of course, only has to be reflective to radio waves. And uh, the radio astronomer who was named or remained nameless, who was using Eukert, saw and he saw some blemishes on the surface of the mirror when he was up there looking at his instrument, and he leaned over with a rag and thought he'd wipe them off because for a radio telescope you could do that. There's just, if you saw blem, you know, if you saw stuff on top of your radio mesh or your radio dish, that's okay to wipe it. Not okay with an optical telescope, and so he actually wiped off some of the aluminum on that part of the mirror. He wasn't invited back. The next question is from Emma. 
I've been looking at an image of NGC 6302, the bug nebula or butterfly nebula. The website says that the speed of gas is fast enough to reach the moon in 24 minutes. So my question is, how long will this image be viewable in space and how quickly will it change? Um, so the butterfly nebula, this beautiful nebula, I know, I know the Hubble picture, but you're probably referring to it is gorgeous, full color, very rich colors, and it looks absolutely and totally like a butterfly. It's very well named. Um, so I guess that speed must have been worked out by the, uh, the astronomers who took the image based on the velocity they would have taken spectra of the gas in the nebula and measured a Doppler shift. And so they could figure out the expansion rate of the nebula. And so that, uh, and they analogized it in terms of how long it would take gas to get to the moon. What was the number? 24? 24 minutes. So, right. So that the gas is moving fast enough uh, to go, uh, you know, a quarter of a million miles, the distance to the moon in 24 minutes. So if you do the math, and that's sort of just under 600,000 miles per hour. And that sounds pretty fast. Astronomy has nebulae that are moving even faster. But half a million, roughly half a million miles per hour, while it's fast, is a very small fraction of the speed of light. And even over, um, let's just put it in perspective and do some mental math here. So half a million uh, miles in an hour is about 20 million miles in a day, times 300 is about 6 billion miles in a year. So that gas is moving about 6 billion miles in a year. Well, a light year is a thousand times larger than that. So it's going to take a millennium for that gas in the butterfly nebula to even move a light year. And that's about an amount that you might be able to see if you took a different image. But that means from week to week, month to month, and pretty much year to year, if you took pictures of that nebula, you just simply wouldn't see it changing. You wouldn't see any difference to the appearance. Because although that speed is fast, the distance and the size of the nebula and its size in space is so many trillions of miles across that that speed is essentially negligible. Okay, the next one is from Roger and Allison via email. I would like to ask why was the constellation of Cancer chosen for the fixed point for the exoplanet, exoplanet hunting telescope Kepler? And then given this area is so small and limited, is there a risk that this may be atypical and provide false infer or negative results? Right. So it's a good question. How did Kepler choose its location? I mean, you pick them, you have a mission that costs almost half a billion dollars, which actually is a real bargain for what Kepler did and has done. But you have one mission that can only point in one area of the sky and do this amazing and unique exoplanet survey. You make sure you get the right position, right? It's like when you land on Mars. It's like a Curiosity rover had to land on Mars. There were originally 100 possible landing sites that got narrowed down to 25 and then four and then two and then one and each time they had a meeting to do that. So these decisions for astronomy are really important. The Kepler decision uh, also took a while and, and involved a lot of astronomers, the whole instrument team with consultations from others. Essentially they were aiming for a sweet spot. It's the sweet spot between having a and it's driven, of course, by the field of view, which is driven by the size of the CCD detectors and the one meter telescope. So the, the engineering of Kepler was such that it can only observe a certain patch of sky. Given that, you needed enough statistics on the number of stars you were measuring that you had a good likelihood of doing the science you wanted to do, which is seeing transits, because a transit is rare. And in any given individual star, if you're staring at it, even if it had planets, is unlikely to show a transit because the transit only occurs when the planet orbit is almost perfectly aligned with your line of sight. So you know going in that only a tiny fraction of all the stars you're staring at will show a transit even if all of them have Earth-like planets, which we think they do. So the sweet spot is finding a region of sky that has a high enough density of sun-like stars that you get enough stars in it to get good statistics but not such a high density that in the CCD frames that you're taking every six minutes, those stars overlap or bleed into each other, which makes your measurements of transits extremely difficult. That's essentially the trade-off. And what that means is they picked an area of sky 
that sort of backs off from the Milky Way. They're actually looking at quite a low galactic latitude. So the Milky Way is not too far away. It's only about 15 degrees away, I think. Um, but they and so they didn't want to look any closer towards the Milky Way because the star densities on the sky would have piled up so high, everything would have been merging with everything else on the CCD. And then they didn't want to look further away from the Milky Way because their number of stars would have dropped below 100,000 or 50,000, at which point they didn't have good enough statistics. So with all those things in play, it was actually pretty easy for them to figure out which field to look at. The other thing they did, but that still leaves you with a, a swath of sky away from the Milky Way that you could look at. Why did they particularly pick Cancer as opposed to some other constellation that distance from the Milky Way? And there they just found a field which didn't have any super bright stars. So you also want to avoid any super bright star in your field because that sort of messes up the nearby sky for observing. So you lose a chunk of real estate because of that. So they looked for an area that had this appropriate density um, that allowed, given the orbit of the telescope, allowed it to be observed continuously uh, and gave them the perfect number of stars. And they, they agreed pretty quickly on that region. Lionel would like to ask, is there any up, down, or left, right in the universe, or is it all relative to position? I.e., how do we know that the Earth is tilted 23.5 degrees relative to the celestial equator? Right, good question. Does the universe have any orientation sense? And and the simple answer is no. In cosmology, there's no perceived way we talk about up, down, left, right, sideways, and so on. Um, we use coordinate systems that are angular. So in astronomy, in, in almost all aspects, we use angular coordinate systems, and that's true for the universe, because the universe looks the same in every direction. We don't believe the universe is going anywhere, so there's no real preferred orientation or sense of orientation. Once we get to smaller scales, though, we have to define reference frames. Uh, and in the solar system, we can define a reference frame that relates to the, obviously, the orbital plane of the planets around the sun. And by convention, uh, you know, it, it's just a convention. It's not, there's nothing absolute about it. There's no up or down in the solar system either, because obviously people standing opposite you on the surface of the Earth, held to the Earth by gravity, their, their up is opposite from your up. So the gravity of the situation means that's relative too. But by convention, uh, people take the solar system to be up, the vector of up or north, when the solar system is viewed as moving clockwise, the planets are moving in a clockwise direction. So it's relative to the plane of the orbits of the planets around the sun that the Earth's axis is tilted by 23 and a half degrees. All right, the next question is also from Lionel, who's live. Um, uh, what new efforts are being made to detect dark matter and dark energy? Dark matter is subject to probably a dozen different experiments now. Some are astrophysical, and probably half or eight, six or seven of them are particle experiments, that is, physics experiments in mines in Europe and North America, mostly, one in Japan, too. Um, so the dark matter experiments are trying to detect dark matter astrophysically, uh, essentially looking for a modulation or, or a, a sort of change in the rate of arrival of dark matter particles depending on the Earth's part of its rotation around the sun, so a modulation that way, the same way we look for an ether with the Michelson-Morley experiment. The deep mine experiments are simply looking for an astrophysical candidate subatomic particle called a WIMP, a weakly interactive massive particle, and because it doesn't interact with electromagnetic force, that particle is essentially being looked for by the, the, the collision energy it deposits in a pretty much pure semiconductor, occasionally a sort of inert gas in a chamber. Um, and where the contamination is all the cosmic rays, all the other particles that exist that might be traveling through the detector. So those are the experiments that are underway. The particle experiments, the ones in mines and and they're in minds to shield from cosmic rays and contaminating signals. Uh, are, are some of the, a couple of them are heading to a regime where if they fail, if they do not detect anything within the next couple of years, then they will have ruled out pretty decisively one of the last and best remaining type of particle that we think dark matter could be. That will be kind of profound because that will mean going back to square one on dark matter. So the dark matter searches have got to a very interesting stage. 
dark energy searches are much more in their infancy and are much more primitive and are much more speculative because we simply don't know what dark energy is. At the moment, its only manifestation is in the accelerating expansion of the universe. We believe it's a phenomenon of the vacuum of space, but we have no physical basis for understanding how that works. And that ignorance, of course, greatly affects you. If you're an experimental physicist and you don't even know what the right theory of dark energy is, it's very hard to design an experiment as opposed to dark matter where we have candidate subatomic particles and so physicists know how to design an experiment. So I would just contrast strongly the status of the searches for dark energy and dark matter. Dark matter is the hunt is on, the game is on, and something very exciting could happen soon. Dark energy, people are still grasping for the theory of what dark energy might be and the ability to detect that except with very simple in very simple ways by asking astrophysically whether dark energy has varied over cosmic time which it appears not to have done and so it's like Einstein's cosmological concept that's that's about all astronomers have been able to do and may be able to do for some period of time okay the next question is from Will who is also on live what's the difference between the Oort cloud and the Kuiper belt so the the there may I'll, I'll make brief nods to each of these people. Uh, you know, if you get something big, a big chunk of the solar system named after you, you're obviously pretty famous. Kuiper is the strongest connection to where I work. Uh, Jared Kuiper uh, was the founder of the Lunar and Planetary Lab, sort of sister department to astronomy and Stewart Observatory here in Arizona, uh, a, a titan in solar system uh, research from in the 50s and 60s. Kuiper also was the first person to recognize the potential of Mauna Kea as an observatory, did the first site testing there by way back in the 50s and 60s again. So Kuiper is a really major figure in planetary science. And he hit the department he founded, the planetary science department, along with the Caltech department, there's one of the two best in the world still. Um, so Kuiper had named after him this region of space beyond the orbit of Neptune where we believe there, in addition to things that are dwarf planets like Pluto, uh, are, are many, many rocky objects that are the size of large moons or dwarf planets or, or Pluto-sized or even bigger. It's just debris left over from the formation of the solar system that never aggregated by accretion to form a substantial object like a giant planet that happened closer in. And so the nature of the Kuiper Belt was speculated for a long time during his life because it's very hard to observe small things that far from the Earth. Now, of course, we've got bigger telescopes that can track them and measure them. We've got New Horizons that's working its way into the Kuiper Belt now and doing a little survey along the path through which it'll leave the solar system. So we're learning a lot more about the uh, Kuiper Belt. The Kuiper Belt is aligned in the plane of the solar system, the plane of the planets, uh, and so it's, it's, uh, it has a preferred orientation. It's an extension of the orbits of the planets. The Oort cloud is completely different. It's on a completely different scale. The Oort cloud is hypothesized to be on a scale of 50 to 100,000 astronomical units compared to 40 to 80. So it's hugely more dispersed than the Kuiper belt. The Oort cloud is also different in shape. The Oort cloud is hypothesized to be spherical or quasi-spherical, whereas the Kuiper belt is occupying the plane of the orbit of the planets. The Oort cloud was also hypothesized before it was actually observed. In fact, it hasn't ever been directly observed, even now. Jan Oort was a Dutch astronomer, perhaps one of the most famous Dutch astronomers of the 20th century. He, I met him a couple times when I was a grad student and postdoc, and he was in his 80s. He did research, an amazing career. Um, the Dutch actually punched the, above their weight in astronomy. There have always been a large number of well-known astronomers over the last century from Holland, a very small country. Oort worked uh, on everything from comets to cosmology through his entire career, and he was publishing actively into his 90s. I forget exactly how old he was when he died, but I think in his mid-90s. So an extraordinary figure. He hypothesized, based on observations of comets that passed through the inner solar system, that there should be a reservoir of comets at extremely large distances from the Earth that spend most of their time in the frigid regions of almost interstellar space, far from the Earth, because by Kepler's law, of course, when a comet whizzes by the inner solar system, it must have a part of its orbit 
where it's moving much slower and is much further away. In other words, these are extremely elliptical plunging orbits where we just see them occasionally in the inner solar system for a short period of time, but they come from much further out. This was, an this was a prediction also based on theory. In the formation phase of the solar system, it was thought that there might be a residue of the original formation material that would either remain at the large initial distances that it occupied, because this cloud that formed the solar system was originally much bigger than the orbits of the planets, or, and or, that a lot of these small bodies could have been tossed out of the solar system by the creation of the giant planets, and the, in particular the migration of Jupiter to its current position, both mechanisms in play. But it's very hard to test, because what is where, how do you possibly look at something that's five or 10 kilometers across, comet nucleus, uh, when it's 50,000 astronomical units from the Earth, and obviously not glowing because there's no stellar, stellar radiation to make it fizz, a coma, and a tail? And the answer is you can. So we've never detected comets in the Oort cloud at the extended regions of their orbit. But of course, we can infer their existence just from the frequency with which comets appear in the inner solar system. And the math of that suggests that the Oort cloud could contain a trillion comets. So that's still not completely verified experimentally for reasons I've given. They're just too hard to see when they're that far out. But the inference of the Oort cloud is, is so strong that nobody really doubts that it exists. And it's an amazing testament to a, to a brilliant scientist. And I think that's all we've got time for today. So thank you. I'm off on a little trip now. I'm going to India to teach my Buddhist monks cosmology, which is almost as fun as these live sessions. And we'll be back with you in a few weeks. Okay, thanks everyone. Goodbye.